City, so glad you're here. Hey, welcome to part two of our new series, It's Complicated, where we are talking about relationships. Let's be honest, relationships are probably the most complicated thing that we navigate day in and day out. And in this series, we are talking about how we can navigate all the different kinds of relationships that we have uh, in a way that honors God, in a way that honors one another. Last week, we uh, kicked off this series. If you missed it, you can get online and catch up with us. But last week, we talked talked about uh, this very simple yet profound truth, and it's simply this. We're all made for relationship. No, no matter who you are, you are designed for connection because you were made in God's image. And as complicated as relationships are, we still need relationship. And, and even though there's probably some relationships you wish would go away... We still need relationship. And, and there are probably some relationships you wish you could get out of, but regardless of, we still need relationships. We need all kinds of relationships because of how we are created. And in this series, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about that. Now, just a kind of a side note, I know that in a series like this, um, many different emotions can kind of surface in, in us. We've actually talked with a lot of people this last week about how there's some pretty kind of pretty big feelings that are wrapped up and connected to this conversation about relationships because it is difficult and it can be hard when we begin to think about these things because I think that if we were to think about our story, think about our experience, we would all acknowledge that many of our greatest regrets in life are related to relationships. And for, for many of us, some of your greatest pain in life, or maybe even some of the great pain that you are experiencing right now, is actually due to relationships in your life. Whether it's something you did, or whether it was something that was done to you, when we think about relationships, and there, there's just some things that can surface. And it's easy to feel shame. It's easy to feel regret. It's easy to feel guilt when we, we think about those things. When we think about, man, I, I kind of messed that one up. Or, man, I, I'm just not good enough here and I'm not good enough there. And all of these kind of emotions will surface. And I just want to say we need to watch out for that. Because, because shame is an emotion that comes directly from the enemy. Uh, and guilt is something that it can, it can be detrimental to us. Guilt can be good in some ways. But if you feel regret and if you feel shame, I want you to know that like, you're not a bad person. And you're not a condemned person. Because we know what the, the, what's central to the gospel is that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? And so as we feel those things, we need to recognize that, you know what? When you try to apply new truth to your life and you try to improve in different areas of your life, it can be difficult because it's easy to think, man, if only I knew this earlier or if only I treated this relationship differently, what could have been? And I get that. I get that. I get it's difficult. But this series is designed not to lead us to feel shame or guilt or condemnation. This series is designed to encourage us to make sure that we're taking steps in our relationship, steps toward more Christ-likeness in our relationship from right where we are right now to, to, to being the kind of people in relationships that God wants us to. To be, And so I just kind of wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that. And if this series, if some of these things that we talk about over the next several weeks, if it brings up some things, if it surfaces some things, we'd love to walk with you through that. We'd love to talk with you. We, 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 uh, in our office, we offer pastoral counseling. We have great, great resources in our community. If there are things that you need to kind of talk about a little bit more or pray about with somebody, we'd love to. And I'm sure there, there are friends and people even in our church community that would love to walk with you. That's why we're here. We're here to encourage one another and to bear with one another in love as we grow into more Christ-likeness each and every day. So we wanted to make sure that you knew that. Today, we are going to focus in on the kind of relationships that we call friendships. We're going to talk about friendships. Friendships are a, a certain kind of relationship that many of us have. In fact, you may be sitting next to some of your closest friends right now. We all have Friendships and friendships are such a valuable relationship 
And today we're going to talk about uh, friendship in a, in a way that I hope is encouraging to you. Um, to get our minds kind of wrapped around this, I have a couple of quotes that uh, I, I read over the past couple of weeks about friends that I just wanted to throw out there. Um, there are these guys called the Beatles. They once said, I get a little help from my friends. How many of you know what we're talking about there? Have you ever been helped by your friend? I hope so. Charles Darwin said this, a man's friendships are one of the best measures of his worth. I thought that was interesting. Uh, for those of you who are 80s and 90s Christians, there was this guy named Michael W. Smith who said, friends are friends forever if the Lord's the Lord of them. I don't know if you remember that song. I thought it was the corniest song when I was a kid. I thought it was the most ridiculous song. I've come to appreciate it a little bit more and more in my older age. Here's a, one of my favorites. This is an unknown quote. Nothing is better than a friend except a friend with chocolate which I personally uh, 100% believe. You know, friendships can change everything. Good friendships can change everything. And if we really do believe in the influential power of relationships, friendships are really, really valuable and important. I want you to just think back. For some of you, this will be a little bit harder than others. But I want you to think back. Do you remember your first friend? You remember that first friend, maybe it was a, a friend at school, and, and you connected, and like you became friends. Maybe it was, uh, maybe for those of you, like maybe you moved to a new town, you got a new job, you remember that first friend in the workplace that you kind of connected with, or maybe it was the first friend on a, a ball team, and then you guys were just kind of inseparable. Friends are so valuable, and friends can actually change everything in our life. Adam was my first friend. That I can remember. He lived three houses down from us. He was uh, one year older than me, and our birthday was separated by two days. Proximity was the greatest factor at the beginning of our friendship, which is pretty normal for childhood friendships, right? Proximity is the greatest factor. But we did so many things together. We were constantly at each other's house, playing ball, playing video games. We had, we had some of the greatest adventures. Like we got into a little bit of trouble together. We got into a little bit of danger together. But, but we, were, we were great, great friends. And from a very early age, what, what we recognize is that we need to have people in our life who are there for us. And we need to have people in our life who are with us and people who have our backs through thick and thin. And oftentimes, our friends kind of fill that gap. Now, when I think about all the friends that I have had over the years, and, and when I think about the kind of friend I have been um, in different seasons of my life, I, I really have sort of kind of categorized our friends into two very big general categories. And there's more categories that you can do, but this is just kind of surface level. I think that I have been a, a, a two kind of friend, and I think we have two kinds of friends in our life. And you'll know what I'm talking about here in a moment. I, I want to call them this, a fill them up friend and a drain them out friend. Okay? The fill them up friend. You know, you know this kind of friend. Like, this is the kind of friend that is like with you, that's constantly encouraging. Every time you're with them, you, you, you feel lifted up, you feel encouraged, you feel strengthened. They root for you. Even when you are at your lowest, they're always there for you. It's a fill them up kind of friend. But then there's also the drain them out <laughs> kind of friends. And here's the thing each friend can be both of these from time to time in different seasons. And we have all been the drain them out friend. We've all been the fill them up friend. But the drain them out friend, they, 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 they take a lot of energy. They, they need a lot. They, the, the, the drain them out friend, they, they sometimes can be a difficult, difficult friend to have. But we've all been this and we've all had this. Now, regardless of kind of where you land and what, you kind of, what kind of friend that you are normally, we know, again, because we're made in God's image, we need companionship. We need encouragement. We need to know that somebody is there rooting for us. We need relationships that lift us up. We really need fill them up friends in our life. But today what I want to talk about, I, want to talk, I don't want to talk about our friends, but I want to talk about you and me. Because we need to be the fill them up kind of friend. And that's what I want to talk about today. Oftentimes, as you think about the kind of friend you are, we want to be the fill them up kind of friend, don't we? We want people to say that about us. But let's be honest, oftentimes we want to do the right thing only when it's right for us to do the right thing. Oftentimes there are many relationships where, man, 
It's inconvenient to be a fill em up friend right now. It's really hard to be a fill em up friend right now. It takes a lot of energy to be this right now. How many of you, when it comes to your friendships, you've had seasons of your life where you just are like, I can't today. <laughs> right? You ever seen those shirts, not today? Like, not today. Like, it's too much. It's going to take too much energy. Like, I don't even know if they appreciate all the things that I do do anyway. I can't today. Right? It feels like I'm the one always giving and giving and giving. I can't today. It's inconvenient. It's difficult. There's a great proverb, Proverbs 17, 17. It says this, a friend loves at what? <laughs> all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. So my question is, how can we be like this in our relationships, even when it's difficult? How can we be a fill em up kind of friend, even when it's hard, even when we don't feel like it? That's what I want to discuss today. Now, many places, in, uh, specifically in our New Testament, in our, in our Bible, we are uh, given instructions for how to live. Like, how, how do you do life? How do you, and more specific, how do you do relationships? But let's be honest with ourselves. Oftentimes, there's a big gap, there's a big difference between what we're supposed to do and what we end up doing. And the goal of our lives as Christians is to kind of close that gap. To make sure that every day we're growing in our Christ-likeness. We're growing in doing the things that we have been called to do. And today I want to look at a cer certain section of Scripture. It's a very famous section of Scripture. But it's, but it's several verses that I think really give us the practical instructions for how we can be a fill em up kind of friend. It's found in a little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote called Philippians. If you have a Bible, I'd love for you to go to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. The, the Apostle Paul, who wrote like over half of the New Testament, uh, he was writing this letter to a group of Jesus followers in this little town called Philippi. And what he writes in Philippians chapter 2 is of vital importance when it comes to our relationships and especially when it comes to our friendships. Now, before we get to Philippians 2, I will say this. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you're here today, you're a follower of Jesus, what we're about to read today is something we have to get right. Okay? If you're not a follower of Jesus or you're just checking the whole thing out, that's great. Like, this isn't necessarily for you. I think some of the principles that we learn from Philippians will help you in your relationships and help you in your friendships. And, and you can kind of pick and choose what you want to do. But if you are a follower of Jesus, these are instructions and commandments. These are not optional. And we must get these things right. And the reason is... Is because when Jesus came to this world, Jesus came and he revealed to us the heart of God and he revealed to us a new way to be human, a, a different kind of way to, to, to live out our humanity in relationship with one another. And Jesus, before he, he, he left and he ascended back into heaven, he, he had these followers and then he commissioned these followers to, to be a gathering of people living their life centered around the teachings of Jesus, living their lives a different way, set apart from the world. And, and these gatherings, they, they began to be called churches, and, and these churches were meant to be known for their extravagant love toward one another. They were meant to be known for the way in which they related to one another, and that relationship, as we talked about last week, that relationship, that unity, the way that people within the body of Christ relate to one another is the primary testimony to the world about the goodness of God and the goodness of this new way to live life following Jesus. But the reality is this, when you see churches, there's, there's oftentimes you'll see churches and, and communities of Jesus followers that do this really well, but then on the flip side, there's so many examples where this is not done well. And this is why it's so vital for us today, if we're a Jesus follower, to get this right. It's amazing to me when I hear stories of people that they're, they're, we do something here at Capital City called Discovery. Many of you have probably been through it. It's a, it's a three-week class for those who are newer to our church community, learning about who we are and how to get connected. And in that class, people tell their stories. And the one amazing thing about people sharing their stories in that class that just blows me away is they talk about how some of their greatest relational hurt came within the church. They call it church hurt. Like, it's a real thing. 
People have, have keep church at an arm's length because of the way that they were treated within that context. And it, I get so sad every time I hear those stories because the church is supposed to be known for the extravagant love in which we relate to one another with. But oftentimes that's not people's experience. That's why we over and over, we, we, we just say this over and over, we want to be Jesus. We want to be like Jesus to all people. And, and we don't get it perfectly every time, but it's the thing that we shoot for. Because people need to feel accepted, known, loved, valued when they come in contact with the body of Jesus. And Paul in these few verses is actually going to give us the bar for what we are to shoot for when it comes to our relationships with one another. And I think if we just take these things and apply these things, we then become the fill em up friend that so many people desperately need. But these are difficult. And Paul's going to give us some instructions that are hard, and it's countercultural, and it's a little upside down, but it's well worth the effort. At the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, Paul begins by saying, hey, if you've ever felt any encouragement from Jesus, if you've ever felt any comfort from Jesus, if you, if you feel connected at all to the suffering of Jesus, and he's talking to those who are followers, those who are believers, I want you, Paul says, I want you to be unified, unified in your relationships with one another. And then Paul gives three instructions. And if we can make these three commitments in our friendships, we will be the fill them up kind of friends that we ought to. To be. Look with me, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Here's the first instruction that Paul gives, very practical. He says this. He says, do nothing out of, everybody say these two words with me, selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In, in, in other words, it is very, very natural for us to want to make life about us. It's very, very natural for us to want to make relationships about us. And Paul begins and he says, do nothing. Don't, don't do relationships out of selfish ambition. Don't do friendships. Nothing you do should be done out of selfish ambition. But this is our tendency, especially in relationships, to think about what can I get out of this relationship? What, what can benefit me out of this relationship? Now, are you benefited by a lot of your relationships? Absolutely. But Paul starts by saying, you need to make a commitment. And here's the commitment. Don't make it about me. I'm making this commitment. Don't make it about me. When you think about your relationships, and specifically your friendships, this is a commitment that you must make. Don't make it about me. Don't make it about me. Paul says, great friendships, great relationships are when people recognize this is not about me, this is not about me. That's the first commitment that we have to make. He goes on in verse 3 and he says this, Rather, instead of making it about you, rather in humility value others above yourself. Okay, now, now question, does this mean that other people are more valuable than you are? No, it doesn't mean that. Okay, we know we're all made in God's image. We all have equal value. We have intrinsic worth as, as people created in the image of God. But Paul says, when you think about your relationships, when you think about your friendships, treat other people as though they were more valuable than you are. We're all equally valuable in the image of God. But in your behavior, in your action, actually treat others as they are more valuable than you. How many of you have ever, any, any of you ever bumped into somebody who you would call a celebrity? Anybody you've ever had that experience? Like if you've ever like bumped into somebody that you would call a celebrity, do you remember that kind of like moment that you were around them? Right? That you had this sense that, oh, they're more valuable than I am. Right? And, and you treat them a certain way when, you, when you're around them. This is what Paul's talking about. This is how you should treat everybody. I mean, just think about it. Think about it. What, what if you just had a friend of yours who you've known forever, pops in your house all the time, you knew they were coming over for dinner. Like, you would probably act a certain way. Now, compare that to how you would act if you knew Patrick Mahomes and his family were coming over for dinner. Right? If Patrick Mahomes coming for, over for dinner, you're getting the two-ply out, aren't you? You're scrubbing baseboards, right? You're getting the best food out. You know, somebody you've known forever, it's just like, whatever, yes, there's laundry everywhere, don't even worry about it, it's no big deal. No, I mean, but, but when, we, when we think, okay, that person's more valuable, it changes the way that, that we act. And this is what Paul's saying. In, in your relationships, 
value others more than you. People aren't more valuable than you. Everybody has equal value because we're made in the image of God. But in the way that we treat people, value them more. In other words, you're, you're putting them up on a pedestal. In humility, you are lifting them up. You see, we live in a world that believes that they rise when they push other people down. But that's not the way of Jesus. There's a commitment that we have to make by recognizing that I actually rise when I lift you up. I rise when I lift you up. This is the kingdom way. If you want to be a fill them up kind of friend, you're going to treat people that they are more valuable than you. But you don't do it in a self-deprecating way. You do it in a way that you recognize that in the kingdom of God, when you lift somebody else up, guess what? You rise too. And you know you've been there. You've been in situations where you've done that for other people. And what does that do for you? That just, that lifts, that lifts you up. When I, when I was a kid on the playground, my favorite thing on the playground was the seesaw. I love the seesaw. And of course, I, you know, when you're a little kid and you're, you're a boy, you try to like launch people off the seesaw, which is what makes it fun. But think about, think about the way that a seesaw works. Okay? When, when you press down to help lift somebody else up, what happens? You're giving them what they need to lift you up. And it's the way our friendship should work. But it begins with us recognizing that, that I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to value you. I'm going to lift you up because I actually rise when I lift you up. This is what it, this is what it means to be a fill up kind of friend. Then Paul gives us one more instruction, verse 4. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships, Paul would say, don't always focus on and look at what's interesting to you. Because we all have our own personal preferences of what is interesting to us. But you look to the interests of others. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I experience this most within the context of my parenting with my children. My children are interested in a lot of things that I don't care at all about. <laughs> And they want to play games, games that I don't care at all about. They want to, they, my daughters want me to play with the Gabby's dollhouse. I could care less about Gabby's dollhouse. It's of no interest to me. But do you know what I do? Because I love them and I love my relationship with them, I get down on the ground and I pretend to be cakey from Gabby's dollhouse. <laughs> I lean into their interests. In our friendships, this is the way we should treat one another. Lean into others' interests. And so the commitment that we have to make is, guess what? I will fix my eyes on your interest. You want to be a fill them up kind of friend? You make the commitment. I'll fix my eyes on your interest. And guess what? The moment when I begin to focus on mine or my eyes begin to navigate only to my interest, I'm going to come back and I'm going to fix my eyes on your interest interest because that's what it means to be a fill them up kind of friend these three commitments i'm not going to make it about me i'm making this commitment i know that i will rise when i lift you up so i'm going to value you above above myself and i'm going to fix my eyes on your interest now when you look at this you're like wait a minute i'm the one giving 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 i'm the one laying down myself and myself and myself and guess what jesus would say yep <laughs> That's the upside down way of doing relationship. But guess what? What kind of world would we live in if everybody treated one another this way? What kind of relationships would you have if everybody treated one another this way? That's the goal. But it begins with us making the commitment to be the fill them up kind of friend. You see, all people want to be known and understood and accepted and loved. And when you treat people this way, it will help them feel loved and accepted and known. We need to be the kind of friends who give this and who provide this. Now, Paul goes on and he kind of gives this beautiful, inspirational section of scripture for us. He says this in verse 5. He says, so, in your relationships with one another... That's what we're talking about, relationship with one another. As complicated as they are, as difficult as they can be, as draining as sometimes they can be. Paul sums it all up. In your relationships with one another, have the same 
mindset as Christ Jesus. If you don't think that you can do it, guess what? Jesus did exactly what we just talked about. If you don't think that, that, that other people aren't worthy enough for you to give this to them, guess what? This is exactly how Jesus treated you. And this is exactly how Jesus treated me. He says, have the same mindset as Jesus did. And then what follows are these few beautiful verses that we, that the church has, uh, it's come to be known as the doxology. These beautiful verses that are actually, they read like a poem. M many in church history have put this to, to music and to song. But are these beautiful, beautiful verses about the mindset of Jesus. If you don't think you can, just look at Jesus for your inspiration. He says this in verse 6. Jesus who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. If you ever think, man, I don't want to do that right now for them. Man, I do not, that's so, that's going to require a little bit more energy than I'm willing to give. I don't want to go to that wedding. I don't want to help them move that piano. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to admit that I was wrong in this situation. Like, I just, I, I don't have the energy. I don't want to spend the time. Remember, remember Paul said, Jesus had all of the advantages of being God, yet he didn't use them. At any moment, Jesus could have used all of his God tricks, but he didn't. What did Jesus do? Verse 7 says, rather... He made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. I mean, just think about the way Jesus came into the world. He did not come into the world as a conquering king. He came as a helpless baby in a feeding trough. He came as a servant. If you've ever felt like a doormat in a relationship, guess what? Jesus gets you. And Jesus came. And he came Unlike any other king would come, he came and he was made in human likeness so that we could understand him and so that he could understand us. Verse 8 says, and being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself. If you don't think you can humble yourself to look at for the interests of somebody else, if you don't think you can humble yourself by valuing somebody else as more important than you are, no matter how you feel toward them, if you don't think you can say, all right, I'm not going to make it about me today, I'm not going to make it about me today, if you don't think you can, take your inspiration from Jesus, who deserved everybody's attention, who deserved to be valued above everybody else, who deserved everybody else to serve him, yet he laid it all aside. And he humbled himself. How humble did Jesus get? Well, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Even death on a cross. Jesus is our inspiration for being the kind of friends that we ought to be to one another. Selflessly be to one another. So this is what Jesus did, and Jesus is our inspiration. Now, there's more inspiration, because look what God did. In response to Jesus... Look what God did. Verse 9, it goes on, it says this, Therefore God, God exalted Jesus to the highest place. You see the upside down kind of way of living? When Jesus went as low as possibly could go, even though he deserved the greatest, he went and humbled himself, and what happened? God exalted him. It wasn't about him, although it should always be about him. And he valued everybody else more than himself, although people should value Jesus more than everything else. He looked to the interests of others when everybody should, be look, should have been looking out for Jesus' interest. He, he humbled himself. And God's response was to exalt Jesus to the highest place and gave Jesus the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, verse 10 says, in heaven. And on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When God saw what Jesus did, God said, yes. That's what this world needs. That's what people need to be more like. That's how people need to relate to one another. And God exalted Jesus to the highest place. 
This is the kind of friend that the world needs, that people need. This is the kind of friend that your friends need. Jesus showed us the way to live. He set us the example. And he invites us into this new way of living and this new way of doing relationship. We need to be the fill them up kind of friend because people need to be seen. And they need to feel loved and accepted and known. And when you do this, they'll feel and know those things. We are uh, just right into the beginning full swing of this year's Major League Baseball season, which is my favorite time of the year because baseball is my all-time favorite sport to watch. And last weekend, there is something really cool that MLB does at the beginning of every year. MLB has what they call um, Jackie Robinson Day. And it is the anniversary of when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball. And every single player that plays baseball on Jackie Robinson Day wears the number 42 on their back. Every single one of them, because that was what Jackie's number was. And they do it in a way of honoring Jackie Robinson. Now, if you've ever read any books about Jackie Robinson, if you've ever watched any movies about it, it is such an inspiring story. But there's one story about the life of Jackie Robinson that I love so, so much. One day, Jackie was in his hometown of Brooklyn playing. And of course, you know, as you, you know the, the life of Jackie Robinson. I mean, he endured some things that we cannot even imagine enduring. He, he, he endured such vitriol, such hatred. He was jeered by fans constantly, other players constantly. I mean, we cannot imagine the difficulty that he experienced. And one day, he was playing in his home stadium in Brooklyn, and he committed an error while he was playing second base. And it just gave the crowd more fuel to get on him. People were throwing things from the stands, that the vitriol just raised to a level that we probably can't even comprehend or imagine experiencing. And Jackie, when he talked about this game later on, he talked about how, how he felt like he let everybody down because he made one single error. And then the way that the crowd turned on him after he made that error. But what happened in that moment is the shortstop for the Dodgers was a guy named Pee Wee Reese. Pee Wee Reese, of course, was a white man. Was, everybody else was white in Major League Baseball at that time. But he was a white man from the South. And Pee Wee Reese took his glove off and he walked over to Jackie Robinson at second base right in the middle of the game. And he just walked over and he put his arm around Jackie. Jackie. And the two of them just stared at the stands together. Reese didn't say anything. He just stood there with his arm around Jackie Robinson. People who were there that day who tell the story said it felt like forever that they just stood there together. They didn't say anything. The crowd started to get quieter and quieter and quieter. And after a few moments, Reese patted him on the back, grabbed his glove, and ran back to his position, and the game continued. Shortly after, in, in reflection of his career, Jackie Robinson told that story, and he said, that arm around my shoulder saved my career. And as I thought about that, I'm like, how many people are all around us every day that just need a friend to walk up to them and put their arm around? How many people are all around us going through things that, that we can't even imagine, going through things that maybe we don't even know, and they just need a fill them up kind of friend, but we don't see them because we are made it all about ourselves. We don't see it because we value ourselves more than we value others. We don't see it because we're so focused on our own interests and the interests of others. We have been called to be a different kind of friend. We have been called to relate to one another in a different kind of way. People need to feel seen and known and accepted and loved. And the way in which you are a friend to them can help them with that. And I think even more than that, the best kind of friend is the kind of friend that helps other people understand that God sees them. And that God knows them. And that God accepts them. And that God loves them. And we can be that for the people that God has put in our life. My challenge to you this week is very simple. Look for an opportunity to be a fill-em-up kind of friend. 
They are always all around us. Look for an opportunity to say, you know what, I don't want to make this about me today. Look for an opportunity that says, you know what, I want to treat somebody as more valuable than me today. Not just because of their status or because of who they are, but just because I love them. Look for an opportunity to to set your own interests aside and pay attention to the interests of others. Even when you don't feel like it. Even when it's inconvenient. Even when it's going to take a little bit of energy. Be a fill them up kind of friend. Be a fill them up kind of coworker. Be a fill them up kind of spouse. Be a fill them up kind of family member. Because those are the kinds of relationships that are going to lift us up as we lift others up. And those are the kind of relationships that this world needs. So be that for the people that God puts 